the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dave Zirin. He writes about the politics of sports for the nation and many other magazines and newspapers. He's the author or co-author of six books, including What's My Name, Fool, Sports and Resistance in the United States, and Game Over, How Politics Has Turned the Sports World Upside Down. And before we start, start, I just want to say, A, how much I love your work, and B, I think it's extraordinary. You know, so often when we think of sports writers, either we think of um, basically people just describing statistics in sports or, you know, basically being homers or um, people being really reactionary, like attacking the athletes who um, did the Black Power salute at, at the Olympics. And so... I just find your work such a, a breath of, of fresh air. And I, I want to just ask you about the um, how you how you came to start writing the the how you found your niche that way. Oh, well, Derek. First of all, thank you so much for the kind words. I mean, I grew up a very serious, very intense, very over enthused sports fan in New York City in the 1980s. It was a pretty high-octane sports time, and not just because all of the players were doing cocaine. Um, and I didn't think about politics a great deal during my upbringing, but that changed for me a great deal uh, in the 1990s as I was coming of age, getting political. And there was a real effort that I made to try to find a way to, maybe the word is justify, uh, rectify, what have you, the fact that I wanted to be um, somebody who devoted his life to fighting for social change, and I wanted to maintain um, my sports fandom. And the more I looked at sports, the more difficult, frankly, it was to do. It was like the more you actually look beneath the surface, beneath the adrenaline-packed plays, the more you see the, the, the rampant nationalism, the insane sexism, uh, the homophobia, although there have been small steps at least recently to see that getting better. And it, it's it's the sort of thing where if you believe in social justice, sports does not seem like the friendliest place to be. And But that perspective really changed for me in 1996 when a basketball player named Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf oh, yeah. uh, took the position of not coming out to the national anthem before games. And um, even in, the, in those pre-internet times, I mean, this was like one of those, I mean, I think today if that happened, it would be a huge story for 24 hours and then we would go on to something else, you know. But in the, in 96, this was a huge sports story, big profiles about it, and Raouf was eventually drummed out of the league. And I'll never forget one of the talking heads on ESPN saying that Raouf must see himself in the tradition of activist athletes like Muhammad Ali or Billie Jean King. And that was news to me. Like, I was a huge sports fan, and I was not aware that there was this alternative tradition in sports of people who tried to use this hyper-exalted brought to you by Nike platform to actually say something about the world. And the more I investigated that, the more I started, first of all, to be fascinated by the fact that so much of this history was hidden from people like myself, who's more of like the mainstream sports fan type. And then the second thing that fascinated me was I was seeing parallels to today. I was seeing all the things that a lot of the athletes then were talking about that these struggles were ongoing. And that's really what inspired me to write about it, to be a sports writer. And, you know, it's definitely not always easy, to put it mildly, um, because, you know, it's, it's not the friendliest of, of communities for these kinds of ideas. 
But at the same time, the only reason why I have a career is that there are a lot of Derek Jensen's out there. I mean, people who maybe like sports but hate the practice of viewership because it is so steeped in in, in a right-wing dross, and it allows... Uh, and there, there's an audience, an underserved audience of people who love sports but really don't like what they become and appreciate a kind of alternative analysis. Well, that's great. And, yeah, you know, I have I learned math by um, figuring out pitchers earned run average when I was six and seven and figuring out batting averages. So I've, I've been a, you know, I, I skipped school in second grade to watch the, St. Louis Cardinals and Detroit Tigers in the World Series. So I've been a sports fan forever, but it's still, it breaks my heart that they are considered so apolitical. And, of course, nothing is apolitical. And if something pretends to be apolitical, that supports the status quo. Um, right. And I, what, you know, I, I wasn't sure how to structure this interview because you've written about so many areas in sports. And there were three areas, really, of, of really mutual interest that I, I wanted to touch on. And and they were sort of the intersection of jock culture and rape culture, the Jordan. meaning of indigenous peoples <clears throat> through mascots and naming of teams, and then the whole economics, you know, the corporate welfare of sports, and the economics of large sporting events. So thinking about this last night, and suddenly it occurred to me that instead of asking about those three things, and it's kind of a joke but kind of isn't, um, I could just mention that um, the uh, Florida State, University football team. Oh, sorry, the Florida State University Seminoles football team uh, recently won the BCS. Oh, sorry, the Vizio, et cetera, et cetera, national <laughs> championship. And it's like we have the whole whole package in in one little place. Yeah, I I, I got to be honest with you. I missed that question. My son ran in at the very end. I mean, I know we were talking about Florida State Seminoles. Well, what, what's the what's the question there? Oh, just that that at first I was I want the, the the Florida State Seminoles and the BCS Bowl Championship that brings together so much of the sexism, the racism against indigenous peoples, and the corporate welfare that characterize so much of the big money sports. It's like it's all sure. right there in one. And don't forget that the star quarterback, the Heisman Trophy winner of Florida State, had just been cleared of accusations of rape in, uh, I mean, in a case, I'm not going to comment, that his name is Jameis Winston, and I'm not going to comment on his innocence or lack thereof because I have no idea, but I can comment and say that, first of all, the investigation itself stunk to high heaven I mean, in terms of how much the local Tallahassee police actually we're looking into it and the second part about it is that the the mentality is particularly on social media florida state fans towards the young woman for daring to come forward and say that she was sexually assaulted i mean really what was it was a head spinner and i can tell you even me like i was getting like the, these really creepy emails during that whole time from people in florida state um where they were talking about who this, like, first of all, naming her name and encouraging me to out her, which is a journalistic practice I, I disagree with profoundly. And then secondly, um, the, 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 like, like you should know the real story about her, basically what, what, what I believe is called slut-shaming, like, like like talking about her, her sexual past. And I mean, who knows if any of that was true or not. But the idea that they were actively courting a sports writer, and I know, by the way, I was not the only one who this happened to, like I mean, it, that 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 that's a scary kind of culture around sports. Well, and we see we see this sort of um, impunity. Um, I mean, you mentioned in a recent article that um, one of the lessons to learn from that whole incident <clears throat> is that it's better to be him than it is Trayvon Martin in Florida, and that yeah. there is this. Uh, I wrote a piece about that because I also could not turn my head away from the fact, like in looking at the story, is that this country has, has an unbelievably horrific history, of course, of black men who are accused of rape, particularly in the American South, but not exclusively in the American South. We can remember Malcolm X's phrase, the American South begins at the Canadian border. But we all know that that was, that was a feature of Jim Crow, the idea that you know, hang first, ask questions later. Um, and people know famous cases like that of Emmett Till and the Scottsboro Boys, 
where, where there was that kind of attitude. Emmett Till, of course, only for supposedly winking at a white woman and in Scottsboro Boys with um, untrue rape accusations. But, but of course, it, there, there are so many other times where uh, lynchings took place against black men who were accused of rape. And so I, I had to also explore this idea about what does it say about 21st century America? But here's Jameis Winston accused of rape, and because he's a football star, then there's this rush to defend him by, frankly, the old boy network in Tallahassee. And for people who don't know, Tallahassee is not southern Florida. It's not where my mom grew up, which was, you know, Cubans and Jews. You know, I mean, Tallahassee is, is the old South in many respects. And the, the fact that power in Tallahassee rushed to Jameis Winston's defense. I mean, it says something about football culture in the South and, and the, the, the bizarre effect it has on, on race and racism um, in those parts of the country. And, of course, Trayvon Martin was not an athletic star. Uh, he was just a kid trying to get home during halftime of the NBA All-Star game. And you saw the way that his, his death was dealt with um, in the South and in the power structure, particularly among the police. I'm not talking social media stuff. I'm talking like the difference between the, the sheriff uh, in, uh, in where, where Trayvon Martin was killed um, and the sheriff not, not wanting to do anything about that and the difference until it had to be removed. Um, the difference between that and a situation in Tallahassee where the local police force are actually telling the woman, boy, you don't want to mess with this with a player on the Seminoles because that's, that's serious business right there. Which we can also um, see the same dynamic in place in Steubenville, and you know, there's any Maryville any number as of, well. I'm sorry, Maryville um, yeah. as well. Um, we could also Torrington, Connecticut. I mean, the the, the number of cases um, involving sexual assault and athletes. I mean, the only reason we even can reference them right now, Derek, is because of social media and the work of groups like Anonymous who tried to bring these to the light of day. I mean, this is ongoing. And what I've tried to write about is, is there something inherent in jock, in jock culture that produces rape culture? And if there is, then how do we combat it? Because I also think that there are many germs in jock culture, some of which can be positive. And one of the most hopeful interviews about this subject that I did was with a woman named Katie Hanida. And I don't know if your listeners even know who Katie Nida is, but she she's a, uh, was a kicker. And she was the first woman to ever score a point in a Division One NCAA football game. She was a place kicker, field goal kicker. And Katie Nida's story is rather horrific. She was going to play for the Colorado Buffaloes. That's big-time NCAA football. And she was raped by her teammates. And she quit the team. And she was blamed, and everything, every horror story that you can imagine for a young woman who accuses someone of rape, let alone football players of rape, happened to Katie Nida. And she went to New Mexico after that and played um, for New Mexico. Which is, I mean, so she didn't give up football despite what had happened. And she had an incredibly positive experience on the New Mexico football team. And I had a long interview with her where we compared and contrasted those experiences so we could really try to get at what is it about football in particular, but jock culture in general that produces rape culture and can it be isolated and frankly, can it be destroyed? And what, what were your and her conclusions? I mean, the conclusions after a lot of back and forth um, was that jock culture left unattended becomes rape culture. And what it really takes is you have to have people in positions of authority, partly because, you know, the mentality of football, I'm sorry, but it's not grassroots. It's very militaristic. It's very top-down. And it's people at the top who usually determine what the locker room culture is going to be. That means coaches. That means head coaches. That means athletic directors at the pro ranks. It means general managers and team presidents. They create the locker room culture. And unless you have people in authority – actively intervening in job culture to make it something less toxic, then this is this is the fruit that it'll bear. You know, that actually reminds me of some of the stuff I've read about um, the relationship of 
military culture to rape culture. That extremely course, similar. A highly militarized. I mean, a military is going to be at risk for being a high rape culture anyway. But there are some militaries that have had zero tolerance policies for sexual assault that have been much better, that have had much lower rates of rape among the soldiers. And to use another example to move it to something which you could argue is perhaps a, uh, a genetic cousin of, of rape culture, and that's bullying culture, the likes of which we saw in the Miami Dolphins locker room this year with Richie Incognito. Um, and Jonathan Martin, people I'm sure are probably familiar with that story. And one of the things about, and Richie Incognito was suspended, Jonathan Martin left the team, and it imposed this discussion on the NFL of how you define manliness. Like, is Richie Incognito the real man because he's the guy who's going to beat up anybody who doesn't uh, do it his way? Or is Jonathan Martin not the real man but the real grown-up, the real adult? Because he's saying, wait a minute, this isn't a schoolyard, this isn't, um, this is a workplace, and it's a union workplace, and I'm going to stand up for my rights and actually blow the whistle on this thing. And, and who do you actually respect more in that context? I mean, that was a question that a lot of NFL players had to confront. Now, what's the connection between what we were just talking about with rape culture? I mean, the main one is that none of that nonsense in the Miami Dolphins locker room would have happened without the tacit implicit or explicit okay of the head coach themselves. You know, it's, that's, that's the people who create the culture in the locker room, and that culture is either productive or helpful or not. And frankly, I, I don't know why this is, maybe because people are much, it was, it was an easier discussion to have in the mainstream sports media than rape culture, but a lot of NFL coaches talked about how they dealt with bully culture, and what you saw was a real variance. And you saw that some coaches had real philosophies about how to actively intervene on the question of bully culture. And like Mark Tressman, the coach of the Chicago Bears. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, wow, wouldn't it be great if coaches could talk as openly and as publicly about how they deal or don't deal with rape culture? Because it's very similar dynamics if you think about it. You know, groupthink, testosterone, a uh, kind of mob mentality, not wanting to be the person who's singled out. Um, all of these things are similar ingredients in, in, in one and the other. And I also want to be very clear about something, just so people aren't confusing what I'm saying. When I say rape culture, when I say bully culture, it's not that everybody who plays sports is a potential rapist or everyone who plays sports is a potential bully. Um, the, the question of culture is, to me, much more about turning the other way. So you see a potential rape at a party or you see a bullying situation and you don't say anything. You're silent in the face of that. That's what it means by rape culture or bully culture. And we can say, of course, the same thing about sports writers or writers in general, when they attend to it or don't attend to it. Now, that, that, that's, of course, absolutely correct. And, there's, you know, and that's one of the things that, frankly, has been kind of difficult at times, you know, is that anyone who works at a workplace, whether you're, you know, you're a professor at a university or a teacher at a public high school like my wife or you, you work in a hotel uh, like my cousin, I mean, everybody wants to feel like they have colleagues. Everybody wants to feel like they have a system of support for the work that they do. And, uh, you know, one of the, I mean, I just say this is that it, it, it is difficult sometimes to do this kind of writing in sports investigative journalism because it, it, there are people who would rather you just shut up because it's sort of like you're, you're, you, they treat you like you're the kind of turd in the punch bowl, as it were. And that's, that's sometimes difficult, and I'm sure it's not as difficult, obviously, as the people who are actually victimized by some of the things you and I have been talking about. I mean, frankly, it's very minor compared to that. But, but just, just to, to put that out there so people do realize that the, this is about fighting existing cultures that exist. It's not some kind of level playing field where the people with the best ideas win out. It's much more uh, complicated than that. You know, I think everything you're saying is really great. And it, it also reminds me of this study that I saw where they found when – what they did is they had a bunch of people in some sort of waiting room, and they would have one person who was in on the test would say something overtly racist or overtly sexist to the, to the group. And what they found is that the response of the group as a whole was not so dependent upon what the first person said as it was upon 
the response of one other person. So if there would be two people in on the in on the test, and one person would say something very racist or sexist, and then the second person would either go, oh, yeah, that's right, and then everybody else would look on it more approvingly as opposed to if the second person said, wow, that's a terrible thing for you to say. And if the second person was able to express disapproval, it gave the other people in the room courage to also, and I'm saying this in terms of that sort of mob mentality and also what you were saying about the coaches helping to create a culture that if the, co- if the coach sees it and shuts it down, that, that, that's not going to be reinforced, obviously. No, I think that, that that's absolutely correct. Um, and the, 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 the best case scenario, Derek, I think you and I would, would both agree, and I've only had the experience of, of this on a team. I've played on a lot of teams over the years, and I've only had really had this experience once unfortunately, but the best case scenario would be if the players themselves determine the culture in the locker room. Like if you have real leadership among people, people who are good people who attempt to create an atmosphere of respect, and you can actually create something that's positive there. And frankly, that's the sort of thing that can exist independent of the coach. Um, Unfortunately, though, because hierarchy is so set in sports, That's a very difficult thing to sort of have created organically. In my personal situation, it only happened because we had all played together on previous teams, and then a new coach came in, and that new coach was sensitive enough and smart enough to sort of let us dictate how things went and would only step in when he felt things going astray. This was basketball. So your teamwork, trust, all that is very important. And it's... um, those are lessons I've taken with me my entire life. And, and, and the lesson about it that's most important is, like, I think that it keeps me from being too cynical about sports and about sports writing because as bad as it gets, I, I know it can be better. It is really important, I think, to, you know, in the face of many of the insanities of this culture, it's really important to have examples we can look to either in our own experience or in history of people who resisted and then it it did actually make a difference. Um, Exactly. Because like you were saying, it can be, you know, I feel the exact same thing about it can be pretty lonely here to, you know, be saying something and then having, you know, it's like, like, I use a slightly different example that's just as scatological that I, I feel like I'm passing gas at the dinner party, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's the phrase "turd in the punch bowl." I think it's all scatological. <laughs> a lot of the metaphors, you know, because it's that idea of doing something inappropriate. In a when place. we're yeah, when we're the ones who are actually, you know, speaking out, or you know, can you imagine? I mean, either that woman that you were mentioning, or also, um, you know, the athletes at the '68 Olympics standing there—the courage that would take. Or so Muhammad funny. Ali, the courage it's that so we It's so interesting that you say that, too, because the other historical pattern in America, and this is what's so frustrating, is that um, when people speak out in the present tense, they're absolutely vilified for it. Yet then decades down the line, the same people who are vilifying them are praising them, and or, the, or, their, or their children or grandchildren. It's so much easier to look back in the past than it is in the present day. And this happened recently. Um, I was doing a story about the upcoming Sochi Olympics where a lot of athletes may be speaking out, particularly on the question of LGBT rights in Russia. And one of the heads of the International Olympic Committee in a speech was actually praising Tommy Smith and John Carlos for their memorable moment in 68. And he was asked, well, what do you think about athletes doing that now? And it was like a, 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 a switch flipped. <laughs> and... He immediately, I mean, and it's just like the cognitive dissonance to be able to do that to me is absolutely stunning. To be able to just jump so quickly, so abruptly, and so crudely, like the intellectual crudeness to be able to do this from, wow, dissent is beautiful. John Carlos, well, not dissent today. Oh, come on. You know, politics, keep him out of the Olympics. Well, not then, because there were real problems then. And then oh, you know, and it's like, it's, it's unbelievable on the face of it. And yet, that's the rhetoric, that's the discourse, that's what we're dealing with all the time. And, of course, this is not just in sports. We, we can say the same thing about John Brown. We can say the same thing about the uh, Haymarket Martyrs. We can say the same thing about, you know, all down the line with the suffragettes. Um, Boy, that's the truth. I'm sorry, uh, for just. Oh, no, no, I just think that's absolutely the truth. I, I mean, in terms of people throughout history, I mean, it's usually one of two things. Like, either you're buried and forgotten 
um, or your political teeth are extracted and you're smoothed down to become something else. I mean, we deal with it every year. There are articles about the real Martin Luther King by people on the left who try to remind everyone that, hey, Martin Luther King actually um, believed in things that are quite radical even today. And we're doing this in the face of, like, yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, but the Department of Defense was tweeting out Martin Luther King quotes, including one that, I mean, I don't think they even saw the ghoulishness of this. They, they tweeted out one, a quote by King, that said, the quality of one's life is not measured in years, but measured in, in your impact on society. And it's like, okay, so is that how the Department of Defense justifies drone bombings overseas? Yeah, we may be limiting people's lives, but hey, that's not really what matters. I mean, is there any self-consciousness that goes into that, let alone the fact that I'm sure Martin Luther King, if he had been in charge of the Department of Defense, would have turned it into the world's most luxurious daycare center? I mean, it's, it's just outrageous. And I think in sports, though, it's particularly difficult to get out the true stories. And I'll tell you one reason for that is oftentimes, not in every case, but the retired athletes themselves don't necessarily have a vested interest in going back to their more controversial tasks. Because, there, I mean, frankly, there's no money in that. I mean, you want to be able to be on the speaker's circuit. You want to be able to go to autograph shows and also context is everything it's a lot easier to be a rebel in 1968 when the fires are burning all around you than in 2014 even if you and i both think that those fires are still there just as much as they were in 1968 but they just operate in a different way so um i'm We've talked about about the rape culture in sports, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but can we can we touch on the um, the mascot issue? Because that's been in the news a lot lately, and I really like your uh, take on it. In fact, until I read your article, I consider myself pretty well educated on these issues, and until I read your article about this, I was buying the um, Florida State University. Uh, story that the Seminoles, uh, I knew that they had, had been paid for their acceptance, but I was silly enough to um, not know that it wasn't the Seminole Nation giving acceptance, but the Seminole Tribal Council. Well, why would anyone who doesn't live in Oklahoma even know that there was such a thing as the Oklahoma Seminole Nation? When are we taught that in history class? When is the Oklahoma Seminole Nation asked for comment on anything? I mean, it, it, that's some of the invisibility of racism that exists. And I think few people in our society are treated with such abject invisibility as Native Americans. You know, I, I did a talk um, at a college in Oregon, and I was asked the question by you know, a perfectly well-meaning, I'm sure, in his own mind, liberal college student. And we were talking about the whole Washington name change, the, the R word, if you will. And he, he, he just said to me, he said, do you think the reason why that there are still teams with Native American mascots is because there aren't any Native Americans left in the United States? And I got what he was trying to ask, obviously. You know, is that is this a demographic question? And, you know, you've heard people say this, that the reason why you don't have teams that are named after Latinos or African Americans is because you couldn't in terms of just basic numbers. Native Americans make up 0.9% of the United States. But there was a Native American young girl sitting right in front of him. She was 12 years old. And she stood up in the meeting and looked at him and said, there still are some of us left, you know. And you could have heard a pin drop in that place. And it's just like the, the, the sort of very casual racism and invisibility. Um, and it's not, and people, I think, God, white people in particular get so damn defensive where if you talk about racism in society, immediately it becomes, oh, so what, we're all racist? Because that's a lot easier to do that than confronting racism itself. And this is one of those classic cases. It's like, it's like, no, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody who wears a Redskins cap or a Seminoles jersey is a racist like they're George Lincoln Rockwell 2.0. But I'm saying that we need to start doing some reflecting about why there's a team named after a racial slur, about why the Florida State Seminoles 
are allowed to go around with impunity and say that they do this with the um, with the seal of approval from the Seminole Nation when the Florida Seminoles don't even make up what 40 percent, I believe, of the Seminoles nationally and. That gets to some very interesting points about then, well, why are the majority of Seminoles in Oklahoma? And then you have to look seriously at this nation's past and about the Indian Removal Act. And I mean, so it's like it's a, it's like pulling a string on a sweater. And oftentimes, when people are watching sports or enjoying sports, that's kind of the last thing they want to do. Can you mention the thing? I I, I didn't. I didn't know this about their mascot either. Can you mention about Osceola and make a connection to Mandela? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you remember when Nelson Mandela died, quite correctly, uh, he was discussed with the most hushed possible tones, um, not just in the United States but around the world. And I think one of the reasons why was the recognition that this was someone who endured 27 years behind bars um, only to emerge as um, the leader of his country. Um a remarkable thing. And he was a freedom fighter, of course, before he was behind bars. Osceola uh, is an unbelievable freedom fighter in the Seminole Wars, fought the U.S. Army to a standstill on multiple occasions. And there was supposed to be a treaty with Osceola. And when he went to the treaty, he was immediately arrested, thrown in jail. The United States was actually subject to international condemnation because of this. That's how esteemed and known Osceola was. And I wrote in my article, and he died in prison. And I wrote in my article that Osceola is in many respects the, the American Mandela. If Mandela had never gotten out of Robben Island, he's, or he's the American Stephen Biko, uh, South African, who never came out. And yet before these Florida State games, you have someone dressed up like Osceola, usually a white person in war paint, who rides out on a horse. Osceola never actually rode a horse because he fought in the swamps. So it's, you see like this constant miseducation that's going on as everybody cheers for Osceola. And the thing about it that's the most kind of hard to stomach is that Osceola was the replacement of Florida State's first mascot, who was a much more kind of step-and-fetch Native American character who went by the name of Sammy Seminole. And that really was his name, Sammy Seminole. And in a weird way, though, Sammy Seminole is more honest for what this is, which is minstrelsy, than Osceola, who is this amazing historical figure. And one of the things I wrote, Derek, and I think you were referencing this, is can you imagine worldwide condemnation if South Africa had somebody dressed up like Stephen Biko or dressed up like Nelson Mandela to dance around the stadium to psych people up before a game? Uh, you, you would never see that in a million years. And you see that in this country because that's, frankly, the price um, of colonialism, depopulation, genocide, Indian removal. This is what you get. So we've hit two of the three. We have about five minutes left. And I know this is not time to do this justice, but um, another thing that you write about, you, you write about so many great things, but another great thing you write about is the... And can I just jump in there and say that's one of the, one of the greatest thing about being a sports writer is, like, I think the stories themselves just pop. And they're, they're, it's a lot, a lot of fun things to write about and delve into. You know, that's another thing I was I was thinking about, and I have a, a similar thing with my own environment, my own take on environmental writing, is that one of the great things about some of the environmental writing not covering the issues the way I think they should is that my own career has actually been, it's hard in terms of public response, but it's actually pretty easy in terms of finding material because right. like, nobody else is writing this. It's like. Are you kidding? Nobody else has written about, in your case, you know, the, the Florida State Seminoles? Nobody else is taking this on? Is this a joke? Right. And so there's just so much material. So I'm, I'm just saying I, I completely get that one. It's, it's, it's tremendously both heartening personally and disheartening socially how much material there is to work with. Right. And, Absolutely. And, and so can we, can we do like a two-minute version of, you know, sports are just fun and games. It's like... No, actually, they're big business with massive um, corporate welfare. Yeah, and yeah, no, no. I don't <laughs> no know how we can around that. Minutes, but no getting around that. No, I mean th this has been a real change in the eco economics of sports over the last thirty years. Um, mm -hmm. Is the mass infusion of corporate welfare and sports 
and stadiums really operating like a neoliberal Trojan horse where our cities are reorganized on neoliberal grounds. And uh, and sports is used as a way to do that, particularly stadium construction. I mean, Derek, you and I can go on a magical mystery tour through the former industrial Midwest. I mean, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Detroit. And what all these places have in common is that they have uh, these new publicly funded stadiums for both usually basketball, baseball, and football, all three. And at the same time, uh, you have the, the destruction, the erosion of union jobs. And the jobs that are created are service industry jobs. So it's not just the question of, of public tax money going to these stadiums. It's the question of the return on the investment and what jobs are actually created. And unfortunately, far too much of public stadium funding is really like this magical alchemy that turns uh, tax dollars into private profits. And basically, it'd be like if I wanted to start a business and then I went to the taxpayers to get – um, funding to build my factory, you know, if you perceive that as a stadium, it's yeah, yeah. no, it's, that's exactly right. It's it, a it, wonderful it's, scam if you can get in on it. Yeah, it's a hell of a scam, and uh, the, that's the whole the, the the Trojan horse aspect of it. Of course, is you know often um, it, it's a popular thing to get a new stadium, although much less so according to polls over the last 15 years, as they clearly and dramatically have not returned on their investment. Um, and uh, I think when you, when you saw it, when you see something like what happened in Seattle, where the beloved basketball team, the Supersonics, was ruthlessly ripped from the team, um, you know, you see you see one of the prices of that. But I think you see the price much more deeply in a place like New Orleans, uh, where you know the levees broke, and the only place suitable for emergency shelter was the Superdome, which had received hundreds of millions of dollars, and where many of the people who were huddled in there could not have afforded to buy a ticket to actually see a game. I remember reading something years ago, and I've, I've wanted to say this publicly. I've never been able to because it doesn't fit with my work. But I, re I read a study back in the early 90s about the multiplier effect for when, when a new stadium is built that you know, right. creates all these jobs, supposedly. And somebody did a study, and they found that you'd actually do better for the local economy if you hired helicopters and threw money out the windows into those neighborhoods. Oh, yeah. That, that's a, a classic... Um line about stadium funding it's about like if you literally dumped a billion dollars from a plane and people just picked it up and spent it it would have a better economic multiplier <laughs> effect than the building of stadiums and that in and of itself i mean exposes a lot of these things for what they are um i mean it's the sort of thing where it's like i mean it's not, it used to be like I, I this is the truth derek i used to go on radio shows and debate people about public stadium funding and you can't debate it anymore because there's just so much data on the side that it's a horrific waste of money. It's, it's like debating whether or not the sky is green. I mean, and no, no one wants to take that position on it either, that, that giving public money, especially in the context of, I think, the new normal of perpetual crisis in which we find ourselves, where our cities are starved by gentrification and, and all the rest of it, privatization, and is that we find ourselves in this situation right now um, where they're not going to defend it, they're not going to do referendums, they're not going to do public votes, but they'll still pay off the right politicians and get the money for their stadiums. So we have about one minute left. What would you like for sports fans and people who want social change and just listeners of this interview, what would you like for them to, to sort of, what's the take-home message of 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 all of this. Can I, can I say the take-home message and then you'll see if you agree or disagree? I, I like that, yeah. Um, okay, and I, you know, he was very moving to me too, but I never can remember his name. The guy that you said influenced you back in the 90s who played for the Denver Nuggets. Oh, Mahmoud abdul -Rabbis. Yeah. It seems to me that part of it is that, you know, his, his courage helped give you courage, and that, for me, is part of how social change takes place, that one person stands up, and then you stood up and held his hand, and now the hope would be that somebody else will stand up and hold your hand until we don't have to have these discussions anymore. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. I would also say that um, for a lot of these athletes, the best thing we can do in the media is to be an ally, and that's like being an offensive lineman. You want to clear space so their voice can be heard. And if people are saying your name too much, then you might be doing something wrong. 
Well, thank you so much for being on here. And um, I would also like to uh, thank listeners. Um, my guest today has been Dave Zirin. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Derek.